Hugo, Nebula, and Locus Award-winning The Forever War by Joel Haudemann, published in 1974, is one of the most popular and iconic military science fiction novels ever written and a time dilation science fiction classic. I recommend The Forever War most obviously for fans of military science fiction. In the subgenre, most appealing is Haudemann's focus on the human cost of war as opposed to glorifying themes of good versus evil. I recommend The Forever War as a science fiction novel that dazzles in the time dilation department presenting main character William Mandela and other soldiers as fish out of water experiencing Earth society and military culture as near outcasts due to time relativity. Finally, I recommend The Forever War if you enjoy some social commentary in your space opera. Haldeman flips the script on themes of tolerance and acceptance of the other. If you've read or you're planning to read The Forever War, let me know in the comments. While this review is aimed at those who've read the novel, it will be spoiler free so that those who've not yet read it can have an idea of what you might expect. In the forever war, humanity is at war with the formidable Tarans. In this future, we would never have even known about these Tarans except for the discovery of Collapsars. Found in space, Collapsars can be used like wormholes to travel vast stretches of space, thousands of light years, and exit at a distant spot along the Collapsar network in the galaxy or beyond it. As a commentary on military conflict and war, the first bit of information that Haudemann shares about this war is the human perspective that the Tarns initiated contact by attacking an Earth ship full of colonists. This is the messaging that's coming from our UN military industrial complex, and the reader will either accept that notion or, more likely, question if that doesn't just feel a little simple or too convenient. The first look that we get at military training and the advanced tech of the time delivers some very cool world building in our solar system, particularly an icy moon orbiting Pluto. Haudemann brings to life a vivid, icy, and dangerous terrain that may have nothing in common with the theaters of battle that the soldiers will eventually find themselves in, but it will familiarize the troops and the readers with a window into the main cast of characters, the cool tech supersuits and finger lasers, the dangers of war that are present beyond just actual battles, and of course, our first real confrontation with one of the most compelling aspects of the novel, time dilation. Main character William Mandela is a private in an elite military crew, Along with his squad mates, he's shipped out and jumping through the Collapsars, life and the Earth he left will never be the same. As soon as he passes through the Collapsars, time as he experiences it will be out of sync, so to speak, with how time is experienced on the Earth. Months away and leaps of thousands of light years means hundreds of years will pass on the Earth. Longer and further missions will mean thousands of years of disparity between Mandela and anybody who happens to not be Mandela how the world changes and how those he serves with and will serve with change is better left for your personal reading experience because it is already well known about this novel. One little glimpse that I'll share is the idea that while Mandela is away and hundreds of years have passed on earth, homosexuality has become an accepted norm and heterosexuality has been edited out of humanity. This was initiated as a population control measure what it means to the reading experience is a very interesting thought process on many levels. Avoiding a deep dive, an obvious question that comes to mind are, what do you make of heterosexuals being abnormal simply because society has deemed that they are outcasts because of the sexuality that they were born with? That's a profound thought experiment for the 1970s. It's also quite brave by Haldeman. Examining shifts in society over hundreds and even thousands of years relative to an individual for whom only months or a few years have passed, of course presents compelling and awkward situations. In the theater of war, equally compelling is that application of relativity to military strategy and confrontation. How do you plan an attack or set a trap on a distant planet or field or space of battle when the timing of a collapse or a jump or jumps days, months, or years ahead of the enemy's jumps could result in technology lag or advantage of hundreds of years. We accompany Mandela on a return to future Earth, and in all the realms of battle and through his eyes, we witness the hopelessness of a seemingly unending war and a military out of touch and unconcerned with the toll that the conflict has taken on those under its command. Haudemann has expressed that his experiences in Vietnam have informed and inspired his work on this novel, and that will not go unnoticed by the reader. This is not a novel to jump into expecting a human save the universe from the evil aliens outcome. Jump now with me into my more spoilery section of this review, my five likes and five dislikes for Joel Haudemann's Fit to be Read, 
the Forever War. Like number one, not surprising, the time dilation elements make this a winner. Probably the most interesting conflict is when Mandela's ship is waiting for the Tarns to arrive, having no possibility of an idea of what type of tech they will be facing. Like number two, it's always been obvious to me to challenge homophobia by asking, what if heterosexuality was considered abnormal and immoral? Would you still choose to be heterosexual, leaving the it's not a choice unspoken? It's still wild to me that Houdeman pulled this off in the 70s. Like number three, the concept of the hospital planet heaven. It's brief and probably gratuitous, but it's a pleasing science fiction treat. Just like number one, I'm also really not buying into heaven. The cost, the manpower, the undertaking to create the floating city, among other things, even in the time period that was allowed, is just not something that I'm gonna buy into. Just like number two, the character of Carl and his strange altered dialect, it makes the character feel like a bad cartoon. Dislike number three, Mary Gay's family and Mandela's family are a total dud. The characters were completely uninteresting. Mandela's mother's situation was at least a little thought provoking and it did serve a point, especially when considered in the context of the time that the book was written. Dislike number five, character development was lacking. There's much to like about Mandela and even Mary Gay, but I think that the impact of the novel would have landed harder if we got to know them and some of the other soldiers at a deeper level. The strength of the novel really are the two big ideas, and fortunately, that was enough to carry it. Like number four, the possibility of Mandela and Mary Gay getting different orders was always a possibility. I like that it snuck up on me and that the first time that I read this book, it really took me by surprise that it would mean that they would be, in a sense, dead to one another. Like number five, I like that Mandela is not the one nor has unrealistic action hero abilities that everybody else lacks. This sets the world more believable. I like that trope, but this was not the novel for that. Despite not being the perfect super soldier, yet still being one of the last standing, so to speak, was very refreshing. Thank you for watching. I'm Michael Everts, and this is Fit to be Read. Oh, I shot lasers and I've seen death. I've seen two men and they were told to share a bed. I spent so many light years in a single jump. And I never thought it would come to an end Oh, I've seen men die on icy plains With this pointless war that I thought would never end I've seen time flying by and it took away my friend and I never thought I would see you, baby War without an end